following podcast was recorded on Tuesday, November 23rd, 2021, featuring Jim Bianco of Bianco Research and Ben Breitholtz of Arbor Data Science. To hear the podcast in real time, you can sign up for a free trial at biancoresearch.com or arborresearch.com or by emailing Gus Handler directly at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. You can also call Arbor Research and Trading at 1-800-606-1872. Thanks for your time and enjoy the podcast. Welcome everyone to the latest edition of Talking Data. I'm your host, Kristen Radish with Arbor Research and Trading, joined today by our presenters, Jim Bianco of Bianco Research and Ben Breitholtz of Arbor Data Science. Welcome to both of you. Today, Jim and Ben will be answering the questions, what are short-term rates telling us? At the time of this recording, U.S. two-year rates are at 0.6%. Ben, we're gonna get started with you. How far have rates moved compared to past tightening cycles? Well, a lot, and one of the big stories here is that we've had this tremendous disconnect between what the Fed typically does as the markets get to recover from a recession or from a slowdown. By this point, we've usually already priced in somewhere around 80 to, I'm sorry, three-year month yields have already moved 80 to 100 basis points. Not that we priced them in, but they've actually already done that. Uh, if you look back historically at all global recoveries since 1960, that's what this chart is showing. The before 1995 experience, when the Fed would move faster, they also had to battle uh, a heftier inflation. Of course, we're getting that now too, but talking about the post-1995 experience. But no matter what, when you get better than 50% of economies across the globe growing above their one-year trends by looking at, for example, at OECD CLIs, composite leading indicators, that's when we've typically seen Fed act, and that was now, you know, almost a almost a year ago. Um, so we we are at a point that is completely disconnected now. If you look at the actual change in what the market's pricing in, which we have another chart showing the movement in three and three month yield expectations. This is using euro dollar futures, looking two years out. This shows you past cycles of, of tightening expectations, basically from the minimum to the maximum moves in euro dollar yields. And what you'll see is they're pricing in 150 basis points of hikes or of higher yields. This is the most that we've seen since really uh, 2008, right ahead of the financial crisis and ahead of some of the bigger cycles we saw, for example, the longest of them, which occurred in 93 to 1994. So we're getting this inertia. It hasn't necessarily hit markets yet, and we're going to talk about that and what that means for you know for 2022. But this is a situation where we we're pricing in a heavy amount of tightening in the face of inflation and now getting towards maximum employment. But we have yet to even see a hike, and we have yet to even you know we have the taper that's just beginning. So someone uh, is wrong here. Um, you know either the Federal Reserve uh, or investors. And for the time being right now, it seems like the investors uh, have this right. And it's gonna have to be the Federal Reserve to catch up and however, which way they decide to do so, which will create a different scenario that we'll get into for 2022. You know, if you look at <clears throat> what happened in October, uh, we had a, this big rate hike started late September. And a lot of the hedge funds they were very levered, reported some of their worst months ever in October. Chris Benotti was down 50% for the month. Brevin Howard's macro fund had its worst month in record, although that fund started in 2016. Roku's uh, also, he was one of the founders of Brevin Howard, left and started his own fund, had another disastrous fund. And why was that? Because when people looked at markets, you could break them down into three broad markets, risk markets, long rates, short rates. And when they said, okay, what is the least likely of these three to surprise us? It was short rates because central banks peg short rates. Central banks believe in forward guidance, which means I will tell you well in advance before we move rates. They never thought that short rates would have these kind of moves. And so they really levered up and it got away from them. And these moves in short rates keep going and going. So the losers, at least initially, are a lot of these levered hedge funds. And if you look at the Commitment of Traders report, by the way, the last data point is November 16th, the levered hedge funds in the two-year notes are still at record highs. They're still pressing really hard in this broader narrative that what these markets are pricing is a mistake. The Fed is not going to move 
multiple times next year. As a matter of fact, you've got a 65% chance the Fed's going to raise rates in the June meeting and 49, call it, 50, call it you know, 50-50, at the May meeting. Now, the only way they can move it May, because the Fed has already said they're not going to um, raise rates until the taper's done, is they have to speed up the taper in order to have it done in time to raise rates at the May meeting. This is what the market's pricing in. A June, May hike, then maybe a July, September hike, and then a December hike. Three hikes next year, maybe starting as, as early as May. And when you ask people on Wall Street, no, that's wrong. That's wrong. Fed's not going to do that at all. And that's where a lot of these lever hedge funds were. And they can't believe that they had such bad months in October. This rise in short rates must be a mistake. And they've doubled down in it in November. And it'll be very interesting to see what their numbers are in early December when they start reporting their November numbers. I have a feeling it could be another bad set of numbers. And Jim, how are investors reacting? <clears throat> yeah, I kind of teased that a little bit. Um, right now, most investors don't believe it. Most investors are, are, are still of the belief that eh, the Fed's going to raise rates next year. Let me agonize over whether or not it's going to be December or maybe it'll be November for the first rate hike. No, that won't be the third rate hike. And everybody seems to be of that camp that the Fed is going to go slow, it's going to go deliberate, that they probably won't speed up the taper. Although we have now have four Federal Reserve officials, including Rich Clarity, the vice chairman, suggest that speeding up the taper is an open question, which is code word for they're probably going to do it at the next meeting in November. They'll probably go from 15 billion a month reduction in purchases to 20. That'll get them done in time for the May meeting if that's what they wind up doing <coughs> as well. So there is that when Ben talked about that disconnect, that disconnect is also apparent among investors. They're not believing market pricing. They're in the denial phase that this is not right. Now, in fairness, maybe the market is way ahead of itself and it pulls back, you know, over the next couple of months. If that happens, there's no market reaction to be taken because no one has positioned themselves for multiple rate hikes. If the market doesn't pull back, there's a lot of reaction to be taken because no one is ready for multiple rate hikes. So it's got a big asymmetric risk. And this is what's this is what's pretty weird is that in this situation that Jim just kind of um, explained with these highly leveraged individuals and funds were, are now uh, you know suffering due to high, high big bets and in short end rates, we're seeing this weird, um, you know, kind of liquidity issues pop up, kind of on the opposite ends of the spectrum. This is this is pretty unusual. So we're seeing treasuries, boons, gilts, some of the the higher um, liquidity concerns based on you know off the runs to on the runs, those spreads, um, they've kind of blown out where you know basically where yield should be on the spline, and they're at the worst levels we've seen since I think September of 2010. On the flip side, all the way on the risk side of the, of the spectrum, we can look at things like triple C credit, uh, triple C rated corporate bonds. And what you're seeing there is you're starting to see them start to awaken, meaning that OAS is breaking up to the upside and wider. And we have a chart here showing when we get just a, you know, use a really simple plain vanilla, vanilla 100 trading day breakout strategy. And if you looked at breaks above those 100, 100 day ranges, what happens? This is something that just happened in late August this year. Well, typically, um, you know, in this case, 80 plus percent of the time, OAS widens over those next three months by somewhere around an average of 140 basis points, which would be sizable. So we have yet to see that really uh, catch up in our current scenario. We just kind of had this slow, you know, stair step higher in, in uh, triple C OAS from from ultra tight levels, but what could end up happening, what Jim just said, is that if the markets are even half right and we start to get financial conditions to tighten, that means deleveraging is most certainly um, uh, you know, uh, possible, especially when we have all these investors that had pretty phenomenal years last year in highly leveraged investments. And what's gonna happen is you have treasuries that are showing some liquidity concerns, you have triple C OAS starting to wake up, it's going to march its way inward um, and get ultimately to the, that middle ground, which is, you know, kind of like Jim always kind of points at the S&P 500. What's happening there to the bread and butter of the U.S. Um, uh, economy? And so we'll have to watch that really closely because if we start to get 
OAS to widen triple C's, liquidity risks remain, and the Fed, again, even goes halfway towards what markets are expecting. That means higher correlations, doesn't mean doom, but it does mean more meager returns and difficulty finding that diversification. So it creates quite a different scenario than kind of the Goldilocks that we saw into this year. You know, one real quick thing about, you mentioned the S&P, we've talked a lot about credit, we've talked a lot about sovereign government bonds and about the liquidity situation, how the front end is moving when it sh when people thought it shouldn't, how, the uh, how it's pricing in many more rate hikes than everybody else. And then, you know, people will, as we joke a lot, you know, well, it's not a problem because the S&P keeps going up. Because if it's a problem, the S&P's got to go down. Within the stock market, there is a curious pattern that is unfolding. In April is when the $1,400 stimulus checks went out. Since April, the S&P 500 is up 17%. The Russell 2000 is up 2%. So the S&P has outperformed the Russell by 15% over nine months. Has that happened over that period? Yes, about three or four times. What was the characteristic of every other time the S&P massively outperforms the Russell? Both indices were down 20%. It's a bear market. It's in the middle of a bear market. Everybody gets out of the risk of low cap stocks, hides and high cap stocks. But now the S&P is going up and the Russell is going sideways. Why? I've argued that in 2021, there really isn't 500 stocks. There's one stock. There's the S&P index fund. And when people commit money to it, they, the stock market, they commit money to the S&P, the spiders. That's all they buy. You know, and, and then maybe they get a little bit racy and they buy some options on Tesla or something like that. But that's pretty much it. Those are like the two or three things they buy. You know, healthcare stocks, consumer product stocks, energy stocks, give me a break. They're all part of the index. That's all they care about. So all that money came in everybody's accounts from stimulus. It's been getting redeployed into the index, pushing the S&P up. But if you're not part of the index, nowhere, nothing else is moving. This is usually what happens in a bear market, not in a strong advance. So the stock market's behavior is also atypical, largely driven by liquidity flows as well, too. Yeah, and on top of that, Jim, it fits in really well with that is uh, zombie companies, those that can't meet their interest expenses, you know, EBIT to interest expense ratios below one, Altman Z scores below 1.8. Um, you know, it's it's not a sizable percentage. It's somewhere around 7% of the U.S. investment universe. But just like you just said in April, what's wild is after those checks and also some of this, you know, extra stimulus faded, that's, they've actually lost money as a whole. So zombie companies are actually underwater. They've kind of skated sideways to seeing uh, modest losses since that April date of this year. So another indication that yeah, investors have gone large cap, that's what we can see that in ETF flows. I think some are still around 56 to 57% of all inflows into ETFs go to big, plain, vanilla, large cap funds like SPY and so on, like Jim just said. So there's no doubt that's happening. It's also, you know, it's part of how investing is done these days, but it's also a sign of, um, you know, not necessarily moving too far out in the risk spectrum. And so we'll have to see how, you know, how does all of that dynamic change, especially when we have higher yields um, and really nowhere to exactly hide. And the big thing we've been watching too, and uh, Jim and I and all of us were talking about this morning is, once we get real yields, in particular, it's focused on the five year, which has been in a nasty trading range pretty much all year. If that can break out above negative 1.5% to higher levels, finally, then we got this real inertia going behind financial conditions tightening. And then that's when investors are going to have to start to get creative um, uh, with their hedging and with their um, whatever risk management that they're, that they're doing. So I think, like we said, next year to me is really the year of deleveraging and efficient risk management. Because um, I think the returns could still be there just in a more meager way. Any final thoughts today, Jim? Yeah, I think that investors need to really understand that you look at the headline indices and you say, okay, the S&P's up, you know, bond yields are tra tracking higher, but it must not be a problem because the S&P's up. Under the covers, there is something brewing. The market is pricing in rate hikes that no one believes. The liquidity measures are turning bad right now. And by the way, that's worldwide too, because the measures for liquidity measures for Canada and Germany and the UK are also at multi-year lows, worst, least liquidity as well too. There's no depth in these markets. 
that if any problems come up or any surprises, and the definition of a surprise is maybe the market is right, there will be three, maybe even more rate hikes next year, even though everybody believes it, then I need to reposition my portfolio. Good luck, because there isn't a lot of liquidity underneath this market as well, too. So don't be, you've fallen asleep just because the major marquee indices like the S&P are 1% from their all-time high, which was set a couple of days ago. There does seem to be some issues under the surface. Well, thank you both for joining us today. And as a reminder, Arbor Research and Trading is an institutional research and brokerage firm. Our two most prominent offerings are Bianco Research and Arbor Data Science. For further information, please contact Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. Have a wonderful day.